Welcome to another episode of Together We Can, the podcast where we explore topics of interest to support students and families in our amazing CUNA School District. I'm your host, Superintendent Wendy Johnson. In February, we hosted a workshop for parents about internet safety, and today I'm sitting down with two presenters, John Clower and Victor Dominguez of the Idaho Internet Crimes Against Children Coalition. We're here to talk about efforts underway in Idaho to help families and children. Welcome. Would you introduce yourself to our listeners and explain your role in the coalition? Victor, you want to start? Sure. Hi. Uh, as you know, my name is Victor Dominguez. I am the uh, executive director for the Idaho Internet Crimes Against Children Coalition. Uh, my background was 21 years in law enforcement in the LA area, as well as uh, involvement with corrections and uh, electronic tracking of predatory serial sex offenders. Uh, I got involved with this organization and actually was uh, the one who engaged with two detectives from the Boise mm -hmm. Police Department who were investigating these types of cases. And so we established the coalition uh, 10 years ago. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your service to the public. I appreciate you. Thank you. John, how about you? Oh, well, thanks. Hey, so I have about 27, 28 years of law enforcement. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, Thanks for saying that. You, you don't have to, but started off in the Central Coast as a deputy sheriff in California. Okay. Uh, been in Idaho for about 12 years now, but after about 19 years there and running a family commercial property business, I decided to go feds. I uh, went to work for the feds. I worked for a couple agencies, but most notably the, the FBI was one of them. Wow. I couldn't get back to Idaho. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the ways to do that was switch agencies. So I ended up working with the Nevada Attorney General's office, okay. and it was through the AG's office there that we actually had uh, an ICAC squad that went after online predators. And there's a lot of different ways that these law enforcement agencies do that. Uh, what we did is set up sting operations. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did quite a few of that over several years, and then I finally retired there two years ago and, and living the life here in Idaho. All right. I found this organization, and... Um, they're doing an excellent job out there. Vic is doing a great job, and I thought I would join them. So last year, uh, we talked, and he invited me to be a board member. So here I am. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you also for your service. Uh, the three of us are public servants, right? We're here to help our public, and Absolutely. it's a really great job to have. So thank you for your years of service. Um, what is the purpose of the coalition, and when was it established? You kind of talked about ten years ago, but what what was right. it created for? It was it was established in two thousand fourteen, as I mentioned, in conjunction with the two Boise Police Department mm -hmm. detectives who were uh, responsible for investigating these types of cases. Uh, the intent was to create a nonprofit that would be focused on awareness through education mm -hmm. and then prevention. Uh, and that was something that uh, they felt was important. And with my prior experience, uh, they uh, asked me to assist them in the development and implementation of the coalition. Uh, and it's something that was badly needed 10 years ago mm -hmm. when we set up. And, uh, because uh, frankly, law enforcement at that time uh, was focused on investigations, arrests, and prosecutions. Mm -hmm. And there really wasn't uh, as much of a focus on going into the community and educating the public yeah. on, on the threat of this type of activity. So you were able to bring a little bit more of a preventative lens to the work of catching bad guys who are trying to hurt our kids. Well, absolutely. And, and I will tell you, and they would have told you, and, and really almost any law enforcement officer today would admit that uh, the effort to arrest and prosecute these types of predators, uh, as much as they make that kind of an effort to aggressively pursue them, mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, is that unfortunately, their efforts are kind of like trying to hold the tide back from the yeah. ocean yeah. and that they will never be able to make a significant impact in that fashion without uh, soliciting the cooperation and support of the general public in knowing about the threat mm -hmm. and in being actively involved in protecting their children yeah. against it. Yeah. So clearly... Awareness and education and prevention 
is uh, is definitely needed and is something that uh, will make a bigger difference than yeah. and nothing against their arresting people and prosecuting them. But for everyone that they arrest and prosecute, it's ex- it's been projected that there are at least 40 other victims of this very same predator mm. that they have no information on and they cannot prosecute those cases. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's an insidious activity. Yeah, yeah. John, would you add to that? And just being kind of a new member, would you add to any more of that, that purpose or yeah. like how you've internalized it? Yeah, so um, I would fully agree with that, that uh, working in law enforcement in multiple different states, mm-hmm. California, you know, Las Vegas, Nevada, Washington, D.C., come to Idaho and you think, wow, this is great, this is mm-hmm. beautiful, there's no crime here. Uh, on the surface, that may be. There may not be a lot of street crimes, as you would see in other large metropolitan areas. Mm-hmm. However, there is a lot of drug crimes, mm-hmm. uh, and there's a lot of, um, I'll call it ICAC crimes, okay. right? Crimes against children on the internet. So, And something else I'll say really quick, this has been Vic's baby. He's basically mm-hmm. the founder. He's done this for over 10 years. He did everything the right way. Uh, set it up as a an actual 501c3 mm-hmm. nonprofit and has has basically organized all of the training all of the board members and has uh, lived and breathed this for the last 10 years so he's done a phenomenal job and again as he stated the main focus is educating parents children but one of the things we also do which we'll probably get into is we help law enforcement yeah. um, by uh, funding them oh, and great. also starting to train them now yeah, which we'll get great. into so. great thank right. you feels good to know your legacy is still going strong, Victor. That is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So how would you describe the volume of Internet crimes against children nationally as well as in Idaho? Well, we've attempted to stay as current as possible from the standpoint of statistically. Mm -hmm. What are the activities that are going on nationally as well as in the state? You know, one of the big challenges for us is the fact that, again, as John mentioned, the perception is that crime is is relatively minor or Mm -hmm. or, or infrequent in in the state, much less this type of criminal activity. And because the nature of it is so uh, not in the public arena so Mm -hmm. much and people aren't as aware as street crime they would be uh, more aware of, uh, it's easy to to take the attitude that this type of thing doesn't happen mm-hmm. here. It happens in other metropolitan areas. But I will tell you very quickly that uh, some of the national statistics are that uh, we've determined 87% of children in America use smart devices, mm-hmm. which gives them access to the Internet. And children as young as three years old mm-hmm. are getting on the Internet through many of these devices. <clears throat> Excuse me. Eighty-three percent of teens, twelve to seventeen, are social networking. Sixty-nine percent of children are social networking by the age of ten, mm-hmm. and the average age of children first exposed to pornography on the internet is twelve years of age. Yeah. So, unfortunately, the amount of interaction between children and the internet is uh, is significant. Mm-hmm. And, it's and that's un- not going to go away, right? It's here to stay, it's right? It's not. Yeah. And in fact, if anything, it's going to increase, right. uh, especially with new technologies and new apps. Uh, as far as in Idaho, uh, we have statistics from uh, the Attorney General's Internet Crimes mm-hmm. Against Children Task Force. And in 2017, they investigated 530 cases wow. of Internet Crimes Against Children. In 2022, they investigated over 2,000 wow. cases, actually specifically 2,304 cases that came to their attention. And they are absolutely maxed in terms of that responsibility with the limited resources yeah. that they have available yeah. to them. So it's a very big problem here in Idaho. And those are the ones that are reported. Right. I was just going to say, to your other comment earlier about for every one, there's 40, is that what you said? At least 40 other victims that aren't reported. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. What child-related crimes are being committed on the Internet? What are some things parents should look for? 
or well, worry about? We've, <clears throat> sorry, I don't know. It's something in my throat here. I apologize. Uh, the items that we've listed are everything from child pornography mm -hmm. to child sexual predators to online sexting, online bullying, mm -hmm. and ultimately human trafficking of children. Um, it's amazing that the amount of child pornographers is increasing and the number of internet child pornographic sites mm -hmm. are significant. Um, and unfortunately, what we're finding is that many of these pedophiles start with that and then ultimately begin to reach out to want to make contact with children mm -hmm. uh, to engage in that type of activity. So it's really something that I will tell you is something that they can, they justify as being a normal mm -hmm. sexual activity, not unlike being uh, heterosexual or homosexual, mm -hmm. that it's just a matter of, uh, of choice and that they're doing children a favor by educating them on sexual activity before they actually engage in a relationship where they're uh, older and involved with uh, another child. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you talk about online predators and child sexual predators, uh, you're talking about pedophiles. Yeah. And pedophiles uh, are very prevalent. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I know it's sometimes hard to hear this information, but it's important. Um, you know, all of us have dedicated our lives to helping others. And in, in my case in particular, keeping children safe and making sure they have a great future. So um, with, with our partnership with you, it, it will help our families protect their children better. So speaking of that, John, I'm going to look to you. What, what are some of the best practices or best defenses that um, parents should be aware of to keep their children safe on the Internet? Well, it's a big question, isn't it? It is, it is. And I'll touch briefly, and I know Vic will follow up. But uh, one of the main things uh, you know, we do here at our organization is we go out and do presentations. And mm -hmm. our presentations are what I'll call awareness presentations. So we're making parents and children aware of what's out there. But also, a bulk of the presentation is teaching parents um, how to keep their kids safe, yeah. right? And so... Um, I've got two boys, mm -hmm. uh, you know, raised them, uh, and thank God they're out of high school yeah. now, right? Yeah. Those are crazy days, but but they're both in their in their early twenties now, mid twenties, and and we made it. Everything worked out well. But um, you know, I, my wife and I were doing this ten plus years ago yeah. when they were on a bunch of different devices. But the main thing is. It's incumbent upon the parents to be involved yeah. in their children's internet activity. Yeah. Right? Find out who their internet friends are, if they have Facebook or any other social media like that. Know who their friends are. Make sure they're real, actual people. Yeah. And there's a lot of other things you can do that we teach, but those are the main things. There's a lot of parents already doing some of the things that, that we teach, and that is at night, some of the, you know, the times that kids get in the most trouble with their devices mm -hmm. are like 11 p.m. to 4, yep. 4 a.m., right? When they're supposed so to be sleeping. When they're supposed to be, they're <laughs> yeah. not sleeping. They're on their devices and speaking with friends and on the Internet and social media. So one of the things, and we found quite a few parents are already doing this at our, at our presentations, Good. and that is locking up those devices, yep. gathering the, the devices, putting them in a specific location, mm -hmm. whether it be a lock cabinet or the parent's bedroom, and checking them in and out. You yeah. know, they check them in at 9 p.m., 10 p.m. at night, and they get them again before, like their cell phone, before they go to school in the morning. And one of the things Vic uh, teaches on in his presentation and asks is, how many devices you have? And he's got a list of all oh, these yeah. devices. And you would be amazed that, you know, 8 to 12-year-olds have access to or have at least three, four, yeah. five devices. We had one the other day. Uh, she was probably 13, 14. She had access to seven devices. Wow. So it's incumbent upon parents to be active with their kids, uh, to know what they're doing on the Internet and, and know their social media friends. And uh, that's all I'll say about it. I know yeah. Vic has Vic, would you more. add to that? Sure. I, I think that what we try to emphasize with parents is how involved are you with your children? Um, do you have a relationship with them mm -hmm. where they feel that that you will 
be available to them, that you will take an interest in what they're doing, and that there's a, a level of trust that means that if something happens mm -hmm. inadvertently and it's something that they feel, the child feels they need to, to talk to an adult about, will they come to the parent? Yeah. Do they have that kind of relationship with the parent? And will the parent listen mm -hmm. and understand and not immediately try to fix blame on the child yeah. for doing something that that resulted in that type of activity? Uh, and, and that's crucial. I know, as I tell in our presentations, you know, back in my age, uh, parents would put their kids in front of the television mm -hmm. when they'd come home, especially from work, and say, here, watch TV. Don't bother me. Yeah. I need to relax. I'm tired. I'm worn out. Uh, nowadays, they say, here, go get on your computer. Mm -hmm. Go do your games. Go and uh, get out of my hair, yeah. basically, yeah. because um, I don't feel like getting involved with you at this point in time. And it's a it's not a, a, a condemnation or an indictment against parents. I think that what the problem is is that there is that tendency sometimes to not want to be involved with their children, to want to distract them. And now that they have all these devices that will access the Internet uh, and they know their kids like them, they say, oh, you know, just go play on your computer and maybe later on we can talk, uh, which generally doesn't happen. So I think that it's something that is a, a tendency and a trend uh, between children and their parents, and, and it's got to be overcome by the parent proactively trying to relate to the child, making time, talking about uh, what their day was like, getting involved on a personal level, and not use the internet or devices like for that access to, to keep their kids busy. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, most parents have no idea how serious trouble their kids can get into. Yeah. They just look at it as a distraction for the kids. So being a connected parent, asking the questions, making sure you have a strong relationship is crucial. Absolutely. Uh, it always has been, and but even mm -hmm. more so in today's world with all of the ways that maybe students may be at risk with a variety of predators on the internet, right? Absolutely. Um, what are some tools? I always believe your relationship with your children, your relationship with one another is the most important tool that you have. But are there some other tools that are available to parents? You know, we talked about locking it up, right? Or, right, right. Like we have a, a tool that we use that um, tracks for words, tracks for, mm -hmm. you know, like things that might be triggers that we would want to get involved in and, mm -hmm. and, and stop or intervene in some way. I'm imagining the same things are true for parents. Absolutely. And again, we always include in our presentations, one, there's a, an incredible amount of information that can be gleaned on your child's activities for free mm -hmm. through your internet uh, phone carrier. Yeah. Uh, and um, they should be looking at that as a way to monitor their children. We also introduce them to various uh, apps that are mm -hmm. available for parents, again, to monitor their child's activity on the Internet and to actually establish sites and apps that they don't want their children to go to. And in some cases, we'll give real-time notification to the parent yeah. that their child just violated that uh, that policy with the parent. So... Um, Clearly, we recognize, and I think it's understood, that in this day and age, kids understand the technology and the Internet mm -hmm. much better than the average parent. Yeah. And so I think that part of what we encourage is don't feel like you have to develop a similar expertise. Mm -hmm. There are tools available to you to help you to, to get the information you want, to be alerted if your child is engaged in some type of activity or a nap that could cause them harm, and don't be shy about using it. Uh, some of it is actually free of charge. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank so, you. Thank you. So 
When we talk about internet crimes, um, you're you're mentioning you know all of the things that we need to do to make sure our kids are safe on the internet. We've talked about this in a previous podcast with some parents as well. Some of their sharing some of their strategies. What what is the relationship between internet crimes against children and child human trafficking? We hear those two words kind of in separate descriptions. How are they related? Well, in order to really be clear and to address that subject area, uh, we have to acknowledge that one of the most serious activities that kids engage in online these days is sexting. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know what that means, essentially what that means is that the child is transmitting sexually explicit photos or videos or even text Mm -hmm. to another child. And it's become quite the in thing Mm -hmm. for kids today, particularly in schools, where uh, if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, uh, it's expected that you're going to send them a photo or video of their uh, child or the child being in a uh, sexually explicit uh, pose. And if they don't engage in that, then um, the social implication is that you're going to lose your boyfriend or Mm -hmm. girlfriend. And the bad part about that also is that when that those children break up, what does the one person who doesn't agree with the breakup do with those images? Mm-hmm. Well, the first thing they do is disseminate that to all their schoolmates in their schools. Uh, they go about sending this image uh, throughout the Internet. And what a lot of times isn't realized is that uh, human traffickers will monitor the internet and will look for those types of images that are coming through and they then can target and pinpoint a victim by uh, using that image to what we call sextortion where they will say to the child, okay, I've got this image and if you don't want me to spread it to your family and everyone that you know, uh, this is what you're going to give to me. And they demand that uh, some type of image be sent to them. And then ultimately, they make demands about meeting them in person. Mm -hmm. And once that that has been broached, once that uh, has been uh, uh, requested by a a predator, then they make the physical contact. And then once they do that, it's it's just a a short step to be able to um, essentially take them captive, and and get them hooked on drugs, get them hooked on alcohol, uh, get them hooked on f- expensive gifts, mm-hmm. and and then convince them to engage in trafficking uh, by s- being involved with adults in a s- prostitution type yeah. of relationship. Yeah. So it's it's a, a nasty web. It's a very it's it's insidious because. These kids are are always young. They're Mm -hmm. always uh, impressionable. Uh, Once an image is out there in the community, they're easily intimidated. And uh, so they'll comply with almost anything that is asked of them. And in fact, the FBI put out an alert in 2022 about uh, young boys who Mm -hmm. were being victimized by organized gangs in the African coast areas mm. where images were sent to them and they were like, a, for example, a young girl. And then they requested that they s- send an image back. And what these gangs were doing was once they got an image, they were extorting these children mm. who sent it to them to the point that it resulted in many suicides. Oh, wow. uh, and so again, it's a very city- insidious activity. And it's really something that needs to be addressed because it's out there. Yeah. Would you add anything to that from well, your experience? The only thing I would say is uh, we've already talked about yeah. this, but it's developing those relationships with your kids. Being yeah. the person that your child is going to come to when they have an mm-hmm. issue, <clears throat> specifically related to human trafficking, um, if your child is online you know, and they meet people and talk with people, Believe it or not, there's some people online that are not who they say yeah. they are, right? Yeah. And so uh, we call that child enticement, mm-hmm. um, enticing a child by use of a computer. Uh, it's actually a crime. Uh, 
And those are predators doing that. And so if you look at a lot of scenarios related to human trafficking, if you as a parent are not the one that the child can come to when they have issues or problems or just need to talk to somebody, they're going to find that somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And if they have this internet friend, um, whoever they believe that friend is, this predator on the other end of that is going to befriend them. They're going to develop a relationship. This isn't going to happen overnight. This right. is going to this is going to happen. Could be weeks. Could be months or longer. And once they built that relationship, then at some point they're going to want to meet up right, yeah. in person. And then they may not be the person that they actually said they were. But at that point, they already have a, a personal relationship, and they think the predators think they can get around that. And if that child, male, female is living in a home um, that's a disruptive home, um, that they don't get along with the parents, and and they're looking for a way out. That predator knows that because of that relationship. And they can set up, like, hey, I have a place for you to come. I'll take care yeah. of you. And they come out of the home, whether they're a runaway or otherwise. Yeah. And, and then they go out, and then they get human trafficked by that person. They're used for their own pleasure by that person, yeah. perhaps, right? Which is, all this is illegal, no matter yeah. how you look at it. Even enticing them on the internet yep. is yep. a crime here in Idaho. But that's another avenue where human or internet crimes against children mm -hmm. can lead to human trafficking, right? There's a lot of different ways. Um, and anyways, that's... <laughs> That's well, and if I may add, the growing issue is that it's becoming organized crime. Okay. And in fact, uh, it is surpassing. That. Yeah. It's surpassing the drug trafficking yeah. uh, organized crime activity uh, because once they sell the drug, then they have to get more. Yeah. Whereas with a child, they can re-victimize that child over and yeah. over and over again. And so it's more profitable for the gangs that are involved in this type of activity to to continue to do that on an organized basis. And something else we've learned recently is that many trafficking cases today have become increasingly familial in nature. Mm. And what does that mean? What that means is that family members mm -hmm. are actually trafficking, in some cases, their own children. Uh, older siblings are trafficking their younger siblings for the purposes of uh, acquiring drugs, mm -hmm. for the purposes of uh, making money. And uh, when they are being abused like that and being sent out as and being victimized by a family member, that creates a whole other dynamic that mm -hmm. is really challenging for us. And I will just say this as a conclusion that in 2020, there was a 98% increase in online attempts by sex traffickers to recruit children. Mm. And this indicates to us that they're using many of the same grooming tactics that they would to abuse a child on the internet, but to actually also bring them into a human trafficking ring. Okay. So that's how bad this activity yeah. is. It's scary. Right. To say the least, it's something that our parents should worry about. And for children who may not have a parent who as has that strong relationship, we always encourage students in those situations. Tell somebody, tell a coach, tell a teacher, tell your principal, tell somebody that that you feel like you have a relationship with that of trust that can help you. Right. So making sure that that message gets out, too, is obviously we want that first connection to be a parent. But if that parent is not a safe person then or a, or a person who may not be able to help right tell a trusted adult that's why we're here to help um, children so a lot of this is pretty dismal um, when we look about the work that you do what what's some hope that you can give parents and kids and law enforcement and teachers and all of us that care about children care about our future well, the hope is that with this increased awareness, yeah. that there's a more proactive approach about taking precautions when their child or a child is on a device mm -hmm. that will access the internet for them. The internet is, some will say, a valuable tool, and it can be mm -hmm. that, but 
frankly, the Internet also can be a, a, a tool that is re- easily abused by these individuals who are choosing to use it for that purpose. And it does require that parents be proactive in not only knowing some of the activity that's going on there and taking steps to help protect their children, Mm -hmm. but you know, the other thing we tell parents is you are the parent Mm -hmm. and you, you are the only parent that those children have. And that unless you take on that responsibility and accept it when it comes to being uh, disciplinarian, if you will, for your children who are potentially abusing the Internet, who else is going to do it? Mm -hmm. And when those those children become victimized, how are you going to feel as a parent if you know in your heart that you didn't do whatever as much as you could to protect those children? Again, nothing's perfect. No matter what a parent does, that all doesn't necessarily guarantee that that child will not become a victim. But I think that I would prefer to be in the position of knowing that I tried to do everything I could mm-hmm. and hopefully prevent the child from being victimized versus taking a blind eye or a naive attitude and not looking at what they could have and should have done as a parent to protect their children. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the burden for, yeah. for parents today. Yeah. John, what about you? So obviously education is hope and connecting this information to parents is hope. Would you add anything to that? I'm an enforcement guy. So yeah. going out and getting the bad guys, locking them up uh-huh. is hope. Um, yeah. On that note, uh, you know, that is the uh, responsibility of a local police or sheriff mm-hmm. department. But the attorney general's office has investigators dedicated to this, but they're short staffed. Mm -hmm. There's not many of them statewide. They're all based out of here and they use local departments statewide, Mm -hmm. small rural departments as arms, if you will. Um, So there's some there's a board member of ours who is from a a smaller uh, department Mm -hmm. in East Idaho. And and he is also full time assigned to the ICAC task force. Um, And so on that note. One of the things that we do, we are also trying to educate law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we have a class coming up at CWI, College of Western Idaho. Uh, They run a post academy there for people that are putting themselves through the academy. Mm -hmm. So they're all recruits. And so we're going to go there actually next week, I think. Mm And, and do another course. We've done a few already. And, and our one board member, who's the investigator mm-hmm. on the ICAC, uh, primarily teaches it. But there's a lot of patrol officers, and I would say, and, and probably Vic too, back in our patrol days, one to maybe three years on a patrol, you respond to a call. And if, it, if it's from a parent um, that doesn't say, hey, my child met up with a person mm-hmm. online, that officer is probably going to say, not much we can do about it. But there are laws here in Idaho, mm-hmm. um, misdemeanor laws, yeah. until they meet up, then it becomes felony level, that patrol officers need to be aware of. This is something we're doing more of. So we're training some of the, the recruits. They don't actually get that in the Post Academy. So it's awareness to, to law enforcement. In addition to that, what we provide is funds to law enforcement. So again, that same department um, specifically has the first and uh, you know I was I'm an EOD dog guy but what's <laughs> what's the term electronic detection dog yeah. yes. right he has the first dog um, and they take that dog out on search warrants when they're looking for these predators mm-hmm. that download porno- child pornography yeah. and others and he finds the dev- the dog finds the devices right um, with with the canine handler this detective and so our organization has paid for oh, training that's wonderful. for the dog, has paid for training for the detective to come mm-hmm. out here to Boise and do further training on how to capture online predators. And so those are things that we pay for and help law enforcement um, do, which which are great. Um, and it's all part of moving, uh, well, taking the movement forward mm-hmm. and educating everybody. And that includes law enforcement. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, when you look at the, the volume of agencies in Idaho, many of them are smaller mm-hmm. uh, rural mm-hmm. type communities, rural agencies. And in Idaho, you can be a police officer for an entire year before you're required to go to the academy. Mm. And then when you find out that the academy doesn't even touch this subject, mm-hmm. then you're really out there on your own. 
and you're really in over your head when you get a call like this because you have no idea what the laws are, mm -hmm. how to investigate these cases, what you need to do to, to collect uh, forensic evidence. And uh, it's, it's a little more complicated than just taking a, a theft report or a mm -hmm. burglar report. And so we have learned and have identified that if the state or the academies aren't going to address this, then we need to do it. Yeah. And luckily we have, like John said, the expert in, on our board who can go out there and talk about it and we can do demonstrations mm -hmm. with the dogs and and there's only two dogs in the entire state and uh, we're actively supporting one of them. And, uh, and so it's good to be able to let law enforcement know, here are the tools that are available to you. Here's what you need to do and what you need to do when you come across these types of calls. And um, let's get a handle on it so that as John said, we can arrest and prosecute mm -hmm. these individuals. Because trust me, even though we focus on prevention, uh, being both from law enforcement mm -hmm. backgrounds, we would prefer to put the cuffs on and yeah. send them to prison. Yeah. And if we can help for that to happen, that's what part of our commitment is as a coalition. Keep our kids safe. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Thank Absolutely. You. We've talked a lot about what parents can look for in um, like worrisome behaviors on the Internet and what they can do. Um, we do have students that listen to this podcast as well. What are some red flags for for students? What should they be aware of when they're on the Internet? I know there's a competition out there for students to have as many friends as possible. Yeah. Right. And, and to be the most popular person in the school or in their area. But I guess the biggest thing is for the students Know who your friends are, mm -hmm. right? On any social media application, if somebody friends you, Snapchat, Facebook, or otherwise, if you don't personally know who that person is, don't accept it. Because nine times out of 10, it's not the person they're portraying themselves to be. Yeah. So anytime you accept a friend request on any type of application, personally know who that person is. That would be the number one yeah. thing. Well, adding to that, I think that peer pressure is a major issue when it comes to some of the activity we've discussed. Uh, sexting, for one, and we've talked about boyfriend-girlfriend pressures. Uh, but the other thing is cyberbullying. And frankly, kids engage in some very hurtful mm -hmm. and malicious bullying uh, that they feel they can get away with since it's typically anonymous. And I think that kids need to recognize that that's a very destructive uh, behavior that can result in some serious consequences, as we talked about, not the least of which is attempted suicide yeah. and actual suicides. I, I think kids need to take some responsibility about accepting that this is not this is bad behavior. This is not something that is a game and that they need to uh, be assertive in the fact that regardless of who else is doing it, they don't need to engage in it. Mm -hmm. And they need to look at it more from the standpoint of the person that's being targeted and know that tomorrow they could be the target. Yeah. So the less they engage in that type of activity, uh, the better it is for their friends and for themselves. And, uh, and don't be afraid to stand up yeah. uh, and, and uh, call it what it is. It's a crime, but it's more importantly, it's hurtful yeah. to your friends and fellow students. And you need to be the one person or the person who says, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I'm not going to forward that picture of right. that was sent to me. I'm not going to put it out right. on the Internet. I'm right. not going to participate. I'm going to stop it. I'm not going to spread that rumor. Yeah. I'm not going to uh, do something that I know is going to hurt somebody else. I don't have to do it, and I choose not to. Yeah. And that takes some moral fortitude. Yeah, it does. And uh, you know what? It's okay to be the better person. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. We have some fabulous students in this district, and I know many of them will stand up and have over the the years when things like that have happened. So Good. we want more of, of our students to do that, too. So thank sure. you for that advice. Mm -hmm. And you, the other thing that we know about young people is that 
even though they may have a really great relationship with a parent or a teacher or a coach, they don't always tell their parents. They think they might be able to handle it. Or they may turn to their friends, right? They may say, hey, this happened to me. If, if I'm a student and my friend reports that they're getting maybe a strange message um, through social media or, or email or whatever it is, what should that friend do? Well, again, Wendy, first of all, thank you for all you do. Oh, and again, you. you previously said this is where you and your staff come into play, right? Yeah. Most of these uh, kids or children are in school just as much as are at home. Yeah. Yep. And a lot of their friends are who they turn to for issues. So if you have a friend who's experiencing sexting issues, bullying issues online, be that good friend, right? And go to one of those trusted individuals. Yeah. Go to those people we already talked about. Every student out there has a counselor, mm -hmm. a coach, a teacher that they trust and they can talk to, the school SRO. Yeah. And, and if the friend doesn't want to do it, be a good friend. Yeah. Go do it for them. Yeah. Because this can lead to other issues. And if that friend doesn't tell anybody else and it continues, they may shut you off as a friend. Yeah. And now that person is isolated. And now bad things could happen. And we don't want Absolutely. that. So make sure you be a good friend. Make sure you talk to a trusted adult, as yeah. we've already talked about. Because these are, these are hard decisions for law enforcement. These are hard things for people that are trained in this. So to think that a young person could handle this by himself or herself is just not a reality. So no. Yeah. It's say smart. something, say something to somebody who can help you. Yeah, right? Absolutely. And if you're the person that it's being said to take, take a step and be stand up for what's right. Yeah, That's absolutely. What you need to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So as, as I said, the work that you are doing is supporting law enforcement. It's, it's supporting moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and teachers and counselors and all of the very many people that are around to help young people grow up to be healthy productive citizens um, you do good work and it isn't something that is funded by an agency of the government it is you guys established as a 5013c so you are a nonprofit there might be some listeners out there that would want to help this work because it's important how might a person one of our listeners help support the good work that you're doing to keep kids safe well, if it wasn't for the issue itself, policemen are notoriously bad in asking for money. Yeah. Uh, but that said, uh, I do have to tell you that absolutely everything that we do is absolutely cost free, mm -hmm. uh, including materials that we provide at these presentations, uh, going anywhere in the state to do these presentations. And... Um, Unfortunately, it costs money in many instances. Yeah. And so, yes, uh, there's a number of areas that we solicit support. One of them, frankly, is we're always taking volunteers. We could use more help. Uh, and, and so if anybody might be interested in wanting to get involved, it's not like you have to deal with the... Uh, uh, the more un distasteful aspects mm -hmm. of seeing or hearing about these types of crimes. It's simply helping us to go out and promote awareness yeah. and education. And uh, so we can always use more help in that regard. But obviously, the bottom line is funding. Uh, we are trying to do what we can to generate corporate support. Mm -hmm. uh, but simple individual donations make all the difference yeah. in the world. Uh, we have a website, which I would encourage uh, people that might be interested in, in, in providing such support. Uh, we are the IICACO <laughs> Coalition. I know sometimes I get caught up. It's, I, I, it's ICACCoalition.org. Okay. We'll make sure and put that out website. on our website. Yes, and, and I would it. encourage you to go and take a look at that. Mm -hmm. We uh, we have a lot of valuable information. We try to share as much as we can. We even have a Facebook page, and some of the cases, some of the things that we share, particularly on Facebook, mm -hmm. are actual arrests. Yeah, and we get photos and and identities and and the specific crime that they committed, and you know it really helps to be more aware yeah. that this is going on by seeing the actual cases. 
that have resulted in arrests and prosecution. But yeah, by all means, please go to either our Facebook or our webpage. Uh, there's certainly a place there to, to volunteer or to donate. And every bit of what we get goes right back into what we do in the communities. We don't have an office. We don't have any overhead. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets paid. We're a total volunteer organization. So every bit of money that we receive goes into providing materials, goes into being able to go to different places in the state to put on presentations. And that's the bottom line for us. We, we're passionate about what yeah. we do. And we can't do enough, and all we need is some support. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you both for being here and sharing this information with our families and our students. Thank um, you. It's, it's important that we work together to keep, keep our kids safe, keep one another safe, and knowledge, as always, is power, right? And it's a team effort. It is a team effort. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, thank yes. you, Wendy. Thanks thank for you, us. Wendy, okay. for having us. Thank you. Thank you to our listeners for joining us for this conversation. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to explore in future episodes, please feel free to reach out. Thank you to our amazing podcast producers, Allison Westfall and Troy Stevens. Until next time, stay curious, stay connected, and remember, together we can. Mm -hmm.